Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on atypical and advanced Parkinsonian disorders, an overview and discussion of application to LSVT Loud. My name is Beth Peterson. I'm one of the LSVT Loud training and certification faculty members and a speech language pathologist. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Cynthia Fox, who's also one of the faculty members and also a speech language pathologist. And we're very excited to be here today to present to you on this very important topic. So I'll go ahead and get started. Just to let everyone in the audience know, we do have our instructor biography, so there's more information about our backgrounds, um, research and clinical practice. And so that's in the handout that you have um, that was emailed to you and also available for download. And I'll go over that in just a minute. Um, in terms of disclosures, both myself and Dr. Fox, we have non-financial relationships with LSVT Loud, uh, or that includes LSVT Loud as a treatment technique. And then a financial relationship for me is I'm an employee of and I receive lecture honorarium and travel reimbursement from LSVT Global. Dr. Fox is an employee and co-founder of LSVT Global and she receives honorarium and has financial interest in the company. This webinar is a continuing education activity. However, it's not ASHA or state registered for CEUs. But if anyone in the audience is a speech, physical, or occupational therapist, and you're interested in using this activity to self-report your own uh, continuing education activity, you can email us directly after the webinar, and that's just webinars at lsvtglobal.com and request a certificate of attendance. And we'll email you a certificate showing that you were in attendance for an hour, and you can use that to self-report your own activity with whichever agency that you report to. Um, so again, just email us at the end of the webinar and we can get that over to you. Attendance for the full hour is required in order for us to send a certificate. In terms of the plan for the webinar, I'll just briefly go over some logistics. Right now, everyone in the audience, your microphones are automatically muted and that's just to make sure that we don't have background noise from the different environments where you're joining us. But if you do have a question during the webinar, there are a few ways to ask your questions. The first is to raise your hand, and you can do that by clicking on the hand icon on your webinar control panel. I'll then see that you have a question, and I'll call out your first and last name and unmute your microphone, and you can ask your question out loud to the group. You can also type in your question. You can do that by clicking on the question box on your webinar control panel, or I should say question tab, and then you can type your question right there, and it will come directly to me and Dr. Fox. I'll then ask your question out loud to the whole group and either Dr. Fox or myself will respond to it there. And you can always email us either during the webinar or if you think of a question after the webinar and that email address is info as in information, info at lsvtglobal.com and then we'll be able to take your questions uh, via email as well. Um, you also have some handouts attached to the webinar, and I sent an email not too long ago, an hour or two before this broadcast, um, that included the handout of the presentation that we'll give here today. It also includes a handout from the Cure PSP organization that gives some information on some of the atypical Parkinsonian disorders that we're talking about today, um, specifically for allied health professionals um, and what to do in the, with those different disorders in terms of different types of characteristics that are presenting. Uh, there's also a handout here that we'll discuss more towards the end of the presentation, but uh, a handout that gives information on a company called Vocal ID, which does voice banking. So we can talk about that later to give you more of an overview of what that is um, and, and who may be a good fit for that. Um, but just to let you know what's attached here, you can find those handouts by clicking on the handouts panel on your webinar control panel, and then you'll see links to those three handouts. You can download them and then print them if you'd like that. So uh, that covers the logistics for today's show. And the heart of the presentation here is going to be a discussion by Dr. Fox and myself on the application of LSVT Loud to individuals with atypical and advanced Parkinson's. Then we'll have some time towards the end of the webinar to address any questions that come up. And then at the end of the webinar, when you X out of the webinar screen, there will be a survey that will pop up on your screen. And we do ask that you take that to help us plan for future webinars, make sure that we're doing the best that we can now, and see how we can make any types of improvements. So thank you in advance for your participation in that survey. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fox, who will get started here with the content of our presentation. Thank you, Beth, and I extend my welcome to everybody as well. 
And here's what we're going to talk about in this next hour. We're going to begin by defining advanced Parkinson disease and typical features that characterized advanced Parkinson disease, as well as describe several atypical Parkinsonism disorders and their features. This isn't meant to be ultra uh, comprehensive, but it sets the stage uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with those characteristics or distinctions, which sets us up to um, the second half of the webinar where Beth will take back over discussing the application of LSVT loud speech treatment uh, in advanced or atypical Parkinson's and how the protocol can be customized to meet the needs of individuals um, at both these stages of our advanced stages or atypical Parkinson's. We'll also add in a few what we call supplemental strategies. So while LSVT Lab may be the first course in behavioral treatment, um, sometimes we do LSVT Plus, and we'll give you um, a little bit of information on some of those supplemental strategies. Next slide. What we'll do now is just try to figure out a little bit about who is in our audience today. So this is a polling question, and in just a moment, you'll see the ability to actually, there you go, um, vote and uh, tell us who you are. Um, are you a person with Parkinson disease or atypical PD? Um, are you a family member or caregiver for people with Parkinson's? Are you LSVT loud certified clinicians, speech language pathologists who are not certified or others, whether allied health professionals, physicians, or um, anyone else who might be in attendance? So we will let everybody vote. Okay, so it looks like we have some family and family and caregivers. We have some of our certified LSVT loud clinicians, and we have a lot of um, SLPs who are not certified, um, and then a group of others. So uh, a nice mix in our audience here today. So again, we welcome you here. Okay, next slide. Let's begin by talking about, you know, what is advanced PD and what is considered advanced. Now, it's not necessarily how long you've had Parkinson's disease, uh, more related to the severity of the symptoms. However, those are often correlated that many times people who've had the disease for, for a longer period of time have more severe symptoms, but that's not always the case. Next slide. So one of the rating scales that's used uh, to rate severities of Parkinson's disease is the modified honan yar scale. And you see a picture of it here, uh, starting with stage zero, no signs of the disease. Early Parkinson's would be stage one, 1 1.5, where it's mostly unilateral. Moderate Parkinson's disease were stage two, 2.5 to three. Now you're getting some bilateral disease, um, starting to get, you know, as you get into stage three, some postural instability, but considered physically independent. Stage four, stage five is where we start to make the switch into what would be considered advanced Parkinson disease. And this is where individuals are starting to experience more severe disability. They're still, still able to walk or stand unassisted in stage four. Stage five, again, more advanced, perhaps wheelchair bound or bedridden unless aided. Next slide. The limb motor characteristics associated with advanced Parkinson disease is an increased severity in bradykinesia and hypokinesia. That's slow and small movement. You may get more rigidity and more um, instances of akinesia and freezing where a person literally gets stuck in their movement and it becomes difficult for them to continue on, initiate and move. Um, oftentimes, advanced PD is associated with not being able to live independently, increased risk for falling, uh, assistance is needed with daily activities, and greater need for assistive devices and aids, and certainly a worsening of posture. In terms of speech characteristics of advanced Parkinson's, 
we have the earlier speech symptoms of hypophonia, so soft, monotone voice, maybe hoarseness, some imprecise articulation. And what we see in advanced Parkinson's disease is that the articulation might begin to get more impaired, um, may experience some vocal tremor, and changes with rate. And so with rate, we can have what, what's considered a repetitive speech phenomenon. In some cases, it's disfluent speech, which may be more uh, true stuttering-like, so some initiation difficulties, inappropriate silences. Um, and what's pretty unique in, in Parkinson disease is this hyperfluency. Um, so palilalia is the compulsive, effortless re repetition of words and phrases. Um, this is against a background of increasing rate and loudness. Word and phrase repetitions tend to occur at the end of the utterance. And palilalia is something that can be extraordinarily uh, detrimental to speech intelligibility. So it certainly is a phenomenon that needs some type of intervention to really help improve um, speech intelligibility. We also recognize beyond just motor speech that some of the cognitive and language changes is, can come into play. And people may need increased time for processing information as well as responding uh, to individuals when they're asked a question. Next slide. Non-motor characteristics can also occur. Now, these aren't exclusive to advanced Parkinson disease, but we may see an increased um, occurrence as individuals with Parkinson disease advance. So uh, changes in cognition, such as dementia, and increased neuropsychological changes. Again, this goes back to maybe some slower processing, little more difficulty sustaining attention, Secondary to medications, in some cases, you may get some psychosis and hallucinations. If that's happening, uh, we always encourage, you know, speak with your physician, let them know, because oftentimes they can potentially do some adjustments to help um, minimize that. Depression, anxiety, and apathy, sleep disorders, autonomic dysfunction, again, those aren't exclusive to advance, but may be more prevalent and pain. So pain can either be primary pain in some cases, or some cases because uh, physical mobility is more restricted. It's pain from, uh, you know, postures that aren't necessarily uh, the best postures to be in. Next slide. So obviously both these motor and non-motor complications can dramatically impair quality of life. Um, the the flip side of that is there is good care that can be offered that can minimize some of that um, uh, impact on quality of life. And of course, the topic of today is how can speech treatment be a key variable that even though as disease advances, these things happen, um, there's the ability to still maximize communication for people with advanced Parkinson's. Next slide. So we're now going to think about the uh, Parkinson's that's not the advanced stage of what's considered idiopathic Parkinson disease, but rather atypical Parkinson syndromes. Um, this figure is from a handout which is actually attached to this webinar. Uh, if for some reason you could not uh, download it, let us know. We're happy to email it to you. And it was put out by Cure PSP, and the contact information is there on the slide. And it's what every social worker, physical, occupational, speech language pathologist should know about some of these uh, atypical Parkinson's. And I, what it puts in perspective is that there's a range of them considered these prime of life diseases. And the three that we'll really focus on today are progressive super, supernuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration, and multi-system atrophy. Um, other characteristics that are shared in these primal life brain diseases can be things such as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which we're hearing a lot about now in terms of you know, professional athletes and people who've had repetitive head traumas, um, concussions, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS, and frontotemporal dementia or FTD. Next slide. So atypical Parkinson's, how do they differ from what we consider idiopathic Parkinson's disease? Next. 
So here are some kind of high level considerations. Most of these atypical Parkinson's have one or more features similar to Parkinson's, such as rigidity, bradykinesia, tremor, postural instability, but they have added symptoms that are not seen in Parkinson's, and that's that Parkinson's plus um, that is an addition. Oftentimes, the disease course and underlying pathology differs from Parkinson's, and we're not going to go into underlying pathology here today, um, but the handout that I just referenced has more information as well as a number of resources we'll provide at the end of the webinar. One of the hallmarks and oftentimes distinguishing feature from, from typical Parkinson's is they do not respond well or in the same way to anti-Parkinson medications. And initially it can be very difficult to distinguish an atypical from idiopathic Parkinson's disease initially and it might be sort of a wait and see how uh, the symptoms progress. Next slide. Here's a list of some of the more common atypical Parkinsonisms. Um, progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, multi-system atrophy, MSA, cortical basal degeneration, CBD, and those are the three that we'll talk in more detail about today. Other ones, though, I want to mention and not exclude in terms of consideration, uh, Lewy body dementia and frontotemporal degeneration. Next slide. Now, in terms of incidence and prevalence, these, these are certainly more rare, um, so not as common as idiopathic Parkinson's disease, and as I mentioned, are frequently misdiagnosed as Parkinson's disease initially. The rates vary from one to six per 100,000 um, in terms of incidence and prevalence, but except for LBD, which has a higher rate. Life expectancy, again, it's variable, but on average, vary from five to 10 years, whereas Parkinson's disease has a much potentially longer life expectancy. And there's oftentimes more complications, Hospital, hospitalizations, which might be due to urinary tract infections, aspiration pneumonia, which may be secondary to a swallowing impairment or falling. So let's start first with progressive supranuclear palsy. And these are just some key variables that help us differentiate it, again, PSP from, from idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And you see there's some nice little acronyms here, you know, if you're working with these populations to help you remember the differentiations. But first of all, you have more frequent sudden falls early in the disease course, so falling can happen shortly after diagnosis. Um, generally, it's a po posterior, so falling backwards ineffective medication, as I mentioned, and then gaze palsy. So there's a loss of vertical gaze, being able to look up and down, downward first. And you can imagine if, if, you're, if it's difficult to gaze your eyes down um, as you're walking, that is one potential increase or cause for increased risk of falling. And certainly there are significant speech and swallowing changes. Next slide. Um, specific speech changes that we can see with PSP. Now remember, in idiopathic Parkinson's, we typically have a hypokinetic dysarthria. So that's a soft, monotone voice, sometimes breathy or hoarse voice quality, imprecise articulation. In contrast with PSP, there might be more strain, strain quality in the voice. Um, speech fluency may be affected either more slow and labored or that hyperfluency of palilalia. There can be emotional lability, so uncontrolled laughter or crying that can occur, language and cognitive changes, and in some cases it may progress to anarthria, the inability to speak at, at late stages. Next slide. Now, MSA, or multi-system atrophy, has three different key variants. There's MSAP, Parkinsonian, that looks most like uh, Parkinson's disease. So small, a slow, stiff movements with some degree of cerebellar dysfunction. Uh, MSAA has more autonomic challenges. shy dragger syndrome is an MSAA. Um, and it reflects the predominance of autonomic failures. So you'll have some Parkinson-like symptoms, but more orthostatic hypotension, 
constipation, urinary incontinence. Um, and then MSA C uh, is more cerebellar. And so olivoponto cerebellar atrophy indicates primarily a cerebellar def defect with minor degrees of Parkinsonism. In this case, there'll be more ataxia, balance, coordination, gait, and speech challenges. Also common is frontoexecutive dysfunction. And so memory and visual spatial functions can also be changed and be impaired. Speech changes with MSA, as you can imagine, there's three different variants. There's three different sort of profiles of speech changes. The MSAP, which is most like Parkinson's, um, has hypokinetic dysarthria, so those classic soft monotone voice, hoarseness, imprecise articulation. But there might also be some, some spastic or hyperkinetic variants mixed in. MSAA is going to have more ataxic. So ataxic has a little more slurred type of speech that mimics that uh, in coordination. Um, so ataxic or hypokinetic, and again, maybe mixed with some spastic dysarthria. And then MSAC, cerebellar, is definitely more ataxic dysarthria. So the slurred type of speech, which again, may be mixed with some spastic dysarthria. Next slide. Cortical basal degeneration, so cognitive changes, mild early on and can progress to dementia, uh, similar ineffective medication, asymmetrical presentation, and apraxia. So apraxia is, is more of a hallmark of cortical basal degeneration as compared to PSP or MSA. And apraxia is the inability to perform coordinated movements or use familiar objects. So in terms of speech, we can see speech apraxia or oral uh, apraxia. Um, and odd movements are feelings. So slowness, stiffness, shakiness, or clumsiness can occur. In terms of speech, um, it's variable. You may have, again, a hypokinetic initial presentation or some spastic dysarthria. With progression, you may see, as I mentioned, some of that apraxia of speech and oral apraxia. Um, progressive non-fluent aphasia can occur in some cases. You may get more hesitant and halting uh, voice and speech production. And another, it's potential to progress to anarthria as, as the um, disease progresses. So some general points to remember, and hopefully that's giving you kind of a, a general overview about how does uh, advanced PD or atypical Parkinson's differ from uh, idiopathic. The atypical Parkinson's are not managed well with medication or surgical treatments like in Parkinson's. Um, the symptoms and presentations can vary greatly and more compensatory strategies may need to be implemented earlier versus restorative type of treatment methods that are used in idiopathic Parkinson's disease. With that in mind, even though the traditional medical management is not as effective, rehab and especially early in the, the disease process is our best treatment to date. Next slide. So our rehab focus in, in both advanced PD and atypical PD is to help individuals maintain or improve their physical capacity. Um, this is a combination of what we might do both in speech and PT and OT. Um, in particular for speech, we want to help people improve their vocal loudness and vocal quality. So even if the voice is strained, how can we help patients get a more uh, healthy uh, vocal quality with adequate loudness that they can communicate their needs? Improve their pitch range, improve their speech intelligibility. And Beth will walk you through how we can use LSVT Loud to achieve those goals. Um, Focus becomes more on maintaining vital functions, swallowing safety, movement safety. And in some cases, we really need to focus in more quickly on key functional communication. Um, in some cases, maybe we can't get back to long uh, conversational, in, um, extensive speech, but we can get individuals to be able to communicate their basic needs and wants emotions and feelings to family and friends, which can be so valuable and important in the face of some of these challenging um, neurological conditions. 
Also, we need help from the environment in many cases, maybe using of external cueing. If cognition does become an issue, individuals may not always remember this treatment strategies such as think loud. So we train family, caregivers, how to use those cues appropriately to maximize functional communication um, or consider supplementing what we can do orally with functional communication with augmentative devices that allow uh, an expanded ability to express themselves. Next slide. In any case, a multidisciplinary team is essential. It's key for idiopathic Parkinson's disease and perhaps even more so for some of these advanced and atypical conditions. So you see where we focus in terms of uh, rehabilitation therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, but our best outcomes are when we coordinate with the many individuals across this multidisciplinary team. And we know again to date, Behavioral intervention is the most effective therapy for improving communication and function in atypical Parkinson's and advanced uh, Parkinson's conditions. So with that, let me turn it over to Beth, who will take over and walk you through what we can do to improve communication um, in individuals with advanced and atypical PD. All right, thank you, Dr. Fox. That was really a helpful overview of the conditions we're talking about here today that advance Parkinson's and those atypical Parkinsonisms um, that she's talked about here. So thank you very much. So what I'll talk about now is how LSVT loud, so an intensive behavioral voice treatment can be applied to these populations, but then also some considerations and ad adaptations that can be made to make sure that we're meeting the unique goals and challenges that can come up with these individuals. So just to start and kind of give an overview, in terms of the delivery of LSVT Loud, it's always delivered by a certified LSVT Loud speech language pathologist, and it's always one-to-one -one intervention. So it's the, the speech pathologist and the client, and it's just one-to-one. -one. Um, we'll talk a little bit about after treatment, how clients can do maintenance groups, but in terms of the actual LSVT Loud treatment sessions, they are individual one-to-one -one sessions. In terms of the time of practice, so the treatment is delivered 16 sessions in one month, and that's four consecutive days a week for four weeks. Each session is an hour in duration, so they're really intensive sessions um, in terms of how many there are. And then that mode of delivery is very intensive and high effort within each session. So we're really pushing patients uh, to go to their high effort levels to, so they can make the most changes possible in this one month of time. For the entire month that they're in treatment, so all 30 days of the month, clients receive daily carryover assignments, which are opportunities to use their new improved voice outside of the treatment room in functional communication situations. And they also receive daily homework practice, again, all 30 days of the month, to practice the exercises and the strategies that were used in the treatment session, and they'll take these outside of the treatment session, so they're getting additional practice in how to use these techniques. The breakdown of the treatment session is as follows, and this looks the same whether it's someone with idiopathic Parkinson's stage one through three where we have the wealth of our research and this is the protocol that was used. The same protocol is used for more of the complex or advanced cases that may be seen. Um, and we'll talk about in the next section here how we can adapt some of these again to make them personalized and, and make everybody successful uh, with the exercises. So the first daily exercise is a maximum duration sustained vowel phonation or saying ah and a loud voice with healthy vocal quality for a minimum of 15 repetitions. The next exercise is a maximum fundamental frequency range, so going high and low in pitch, so something like this, ah, and clients do 15 repetitions of that, ah, and that would be a low, so they do 15 repetitions of each of those. Next, clients are asked to do maximum functional speech loudness exercises, or what we call functional phrases, where clients come up with 10 phrases that they say every single day, and then during the treatment session, they repeat that list of 10 phrases five times. Um, and they'll also do that outside of treatment as part of homework. For the hierarchy exercises, this will always be the second half of the treatment session. And this is where clinicians will progress their clients from week to week in terms of the length of speaking that they're doing and the complexity of the tasks. 
So for example, in week one, clients are working on using this new loud voice, improved quality, um, in words and short phrases. And they're progressing all the way into continuous conversation by week four. And we'll talk a little bit about how that complexity increases and how for some of these more advanced or atypical Parkinsonisms, how we might not get to that level of complete conversation, continuous conversation using that loud voice, but as Dr. Fox mentioned, maybe we do have some external cueing for those more extended speaking periods. But that's the progression um, in terms of the hierarchy, moving from words and short phrases to sentence level to continuous reading into spontaneous conversation and gradually building up that complexity across those four weeks to really work on clients' individual functional long-term communication goals. And then as I mentioned, there's always homework and carryover exercises all 30 days of the month that a client is in treatment. So the gold standard delivery, and by that we mean the, the gold standard is what the protocol was done in the research studies that we have most of our research on. Um, and so again, it's the same protocol that I just showed you on the last two slides. So with the individuals that we're talking about here today, with advanced or atypical Parkinson's, what we're seeing in terms of outcomes is there is a little bit of a greater variability in treatment effect. So we're not seeing the same types of outcomes or the same level of outcomes that we do for earlier stages of the disease. We are seeing some improvements. We're seeing improvements from the start of therapy to the end of that week of treatment but the gains may not be as significant as those, again, earlier on in the course of the disease. Um, also more difficulty maintaining those treatment effects. So we might see some, some nice results from the beginning of treatment to the end of that month of treatment, but if we look out to that six month mark after treatment, we're not seeing the maintenance at a, as high of a level as we would for idiopathic stages one through three. Um, we may need to increase calibration effort and activities. And by calibration, we just mean um, calibrating clients to this new vocal effort and loudness so that they use it all the time. So we might have to have more calibration in our treatment exercises, um, more emphasis on the importance of the home exercise program to make sure that clients are practicing at home, not only during the month of treatment, but also after treatment to help maintain those effects as much as possible. We also spend more time educating and training caregivers on what would be appropriate cueing for increased loudness outside of treatment. So again, kind of training those caregivers to be a coach outside of treatment to help encourage that new loud voice in as many situations as possible. Sometimes we may use a more, uh, a, a different cue in terms of loudness instead of just asking a client to be loud. We might say, well, let me hear what it sounds like to shout because it takes that level of cueing just to bring a patient up to within normal limits loudness. So it's not that we want these clients to be shouting or overly loud, but again, sometimes that higher cue or that um, even more advanced cue can bring out that voice to the best quality and voice that we'll get for that client as opposed to just saying loud. For these clients, we also recommend more frequent follow-ups and refresher sessions. So. We recommend checking in every one to two months with these clients to see how they're progressing and if they are losing some of those effects to bring them back in for what we call tune-up or refresher sessions to try to get them back up to where they were at the end of treatment. So we may do that more frequently than we would for those with idiopathic um, stages one through three of the disease. So in terms of deciding who's a good candidate for the treatment, during our assessment, we always do stimulability testing. And that is really just to look at when I ask this client or I model for this client a louder voice, does that louder voice have an impact on improving the speech and the voice? So the client, or let me actually pull these up here. The client would be asked to do these different types of exercises. They would be asked to do that maximum duration, ah, uh, and the clinician is really modeling that loudness, modeling that good quality, and trying to shape the client's output into the best possible awe they can get. They would do the same thing with the highs and lows, and then also modeling a nice loud voice with the functional phrases to see if this client does use these strategies and produce a voice um, that is louder, like the clinician is doing for them and seeing the ability testing, does this have an impact on improving their overall voice and speech and overall communication? So we're seeing during that seeming ability testing if someone seems like a good candidate for the treatment. If a clinician does see 
some nice positive changes during student mobility testing, then we recommend that they try four consecutive initial sessions as if they're going to do all 16 sessions, but they'll try just a week-long trial of treatment and evaluate the impact there. So if they go in and do those treatment sessions for that week of treatment, are they continuing to see some positive changes, positive uh, results on communication? They'll monitor progress in treatment and then quantify those treatment changes um, for reimbursement purposes and also just for kind of that body of research to know, um, you know, what, what are you seeing with other types of clients, the more advanced Parkinson's or atypical, a, atypical PD, um, what are those treatment changes looking like? And we always recommend to our clinicians, um, to our clients, we say don't underestimate the ability of a person with advanced or atypical Parkinson's. We say everyone deserves a chance and that's why we do recommend trying that simulability testing, try that one week trial of therapy because you really can be amazed at some of the functional outcomes that you can get from these individuals. Again, even if it does require some external cueing at, at the end of the treatment, still to be able to have that loud voice and have the person feel that empowerment of being able to communicate on their own can be such a powerful outcome for them. There are a couple research studies that have been done on looking at um, LSVT loud for atypical Parkinson's. And so those re references are listed on here if you're interested in learning more about the research that's been done on it. Um, again, these are we don't have the, the number of participants that we did in those gold standard or, or level one efficacy studies, but does show some application to these other populations. And you can see uh, kind of the treatment effects and what that looks like compared to what we see with idiopathic stages one through three. So now we'll talk about some of the adaptations that can be made to the LSVT loud exercises to ensure kind of optimal outcomes or, or success for these clients. So for that daily exercise one, that maximum duration of sustained awe, some of these clients may have a shorter duration time, but they'll do more repetitions. So with the LSVT loud protocol, we wanna make sure that we're spending still an equal amount of time on these exercises as we would for someone who wasn't as advanced. So for example, if we have someone who can only do a short awe, maybe two or three seconds, you know, up to five seconds, whatever it may be, but we're getting that good loudness and quality, we wanna keep doing those repetitions, but we'll do more than the, the minimum of 15. We might do 30 or more to get that good motor practice, that good repetition for these clients. We may have more rest periods or longer rest periods between repetitions, so rest as needed. And the clinician may spend more time modeling and shaping to get those best vocal productions because we wanna get the most optimally efficient voice quality for each patient as soon as we can every day. Um, but it may take a little bit longer to shape that voice into, into the best vocal production that we can get. For the maximum fundamental frequency range or those high and low odds, Sometimes these pitch range exercises can open the door to improve voice quality and sustain vowel phonation. So if a client or a clinician is really struggling to get that nice, loud, good quality voice with the awe exercise, we still encourage go to the next exercise and see what you can get during the highs and lows. And some clients do better on the highs and lows, and then you can go back and try to do some of those odds again. And again, it kind of opens the door to what that feels like or the effort it should feel and how it should come out for those awe exercises. Um, in other cases, some clinicians may need to reset the exercise more frequently to ensure the client is starting at that max awe. Um, so with the high and the low exercise, we always start at that modal pitch awe, the same awe we do during daily exercise one when we do that maximum duration awe. That's where clients are starting their high and their low. So sometimes when we go high and low, the pitch is off, they're starting too high or too low, or they lose all the loudness when they initially start the exercise. So we'll have clinicians say, okay, just do ah uh, for five seconds. Ah, uh, yes, okay, now start there. Ah, uh, and that can just reset the client to know where to begin the exercises, both for the high and the low. And the same thing with the high and low. Uh, the clinician may spend more time modeling and shaping to get those best vocal productions for this exercise as well. The functional phrases, so again, these are 10 phrases that a client says every single day in everyday living. And the idea behind these is to kind of tap into what a client says outside of treatment and overlearn these phrases. 
and repeat them. They're overly learned and repeated in treatment so that when they go home and they say these phrases, they think, oh yeah, I said this in treatment. This is my functional phrase. And they remember to use their loud voice because it's so overlearned for them, or we call it the hook into their daily living. So with these, we wanna make sure that they are phrases that a client says every single day. And oftentimes we'll assign these as part of homework during day one of treatment. So we'll say, okay, I want you to go home, think about what you do the rest of your day, write down the phrases or, or, or short sentences that you say, and bring those back the next day and we'll get your 10 phrases well established. So we may encourage family members to help participate with this and kind of walk them through their client's day. You know, what do you say first thing in the morning? What do you say when you answer the phone, before you go to bed, whatever it may be, to get some of that family input to help create those phrases. If we do use family members, we just wanna make sure that the phrases that the client is bringing back are truly client, or phrases that the client says and not what others want them to say. So just making sure that we're using the client's own words for these phrases, because these can really have a huge functional impact if these are the things that are said almost every single day, um, that, these, that the client is comfortable and confident saying these. And with this, we may utilize increased repetition. So more than just reading the 10 phrases five times, we may do more repetitions of that or even include these as some of the hierarchy practice because these can really be key functional outcomes for clients. So again, as Dr. Fox had mentioned before, some of these clients may never get to a level where they can have continuous conversation and be easily understood. But if they can do these 10 phrases without any external cueing or any additional help, that is really empowering to be able to be heard and understood in some of these key functional situations that they're in every single day. So you really wanna give them that power, that confidence that they can be heard and understood. And this is a great way to do that. The speech hierarchy, again, that second half of the session, this is when we progress in complexity and duration of speaking tasks, using that new loud voice, um, good vocal quality. And for some clients, you heard with Dr. Fox's overview of some of these disorders, we may need to adjust some of the reading material for people with language or visual impairment. So whether that's selecting a different font or um, font size or the position of the readings or perhaps doing picture descriptions instead of readings, we might do more repetition or imitation of words and phrases. Um, as a clinician, we just recommend to them that they don't always over-exaggerate their model of loudness because we want the client to be see what they're doing without any external cueing as well. And we might do some like sentence starters, tell me two things you did this weekend, or yesterday I, and kind of a fill in the blank. Again, picture description can be helpful. Um, making sure that we're allowing for sufficient time for any cognitive processing, letting people respond and giving them time to do that instead of jumping all over and saying, oh, okay, do it again, or uh, just, just interrupting them too quickly. Um, with this one, we also, also might use the motor start of that awe exercise as needed to rev up the system. It might be that by this time in the treatment session, clients have said, oh, you know, I can use my awe voice or do those exercises, but I can't actually speak loud. Like, that's fine to do that loudness in those exercises, but it, I can't do it when I'm actually speaking. I, I just sound crazy or it's not comfortable. And so a lot of times we'll have to go back and maybe pair an awe with a phrase. So, ah, oh, what's for dinner? And remind clients that same effort and loudness you feel during that awe, you need to feel that when you say what's for dinner or when you answer the phone. So sometimes we'll pair that awe as needed to, again, rev up that system or bring back that effort so they know you use this effort every time that you're speaking. So calibration, um, and again, this is helping clients generalize their, their new loud voice and be comfortable with that new loud voice so they will use it outside of treatment. So calibrating clients to use this new loud voice can be more challenging, but it remains just as important because if they're not comfortable, if they're not calibrated during your treatment sessions, there's no way that they'll carry over outside of treatment and use this loud voice outside of the treatment room. Educating them on um, some of the deficits or, or what, what's going on in treatment can be more difficult because of some of those cognitive impairments. So again, that's we might educate some caregivers and, and care partners and family members on, uh, on these deficits that, that occur and then also the techniques and strategies that we're doing in treatment so that they can help in the home environment. Um, differences played back on audio may not be as easily perceived. A lot of times with our clients that are earlier stage disease, 
if we play back their new loud voice and play it back for them, they can really hear the difference in their old voice versus their new voice. So it might take more convincing for some of these more advanced clients. Some of those benefits or rewards of improved communication may be harder to establish. So really trying to figure out what would be a motivator? Who do they want to talk to? You know, what situations are most difficult for them? What would kind of give the most bang for the buck outside of treatment? And trying to think of those situations to help that keep that motivation up in treatment and help show the benefit that that the client can kind of reap the reward from um, based on this improved communication. And it's really critical to find those emotionally salient opportunities so clients will feel, again, that reward of improved communication and know that they're in charge and they have the power to do that. In terms of homework, this will be 30 days of the month. And basically, homework... Um, Homework includes carryover exercises, and then it also includes a mini treatment session at home. So they would do ahs, highs and lows, functional phrases, and hierarchy exercises in the home environment. As part of homework, again, they have a carryover assignment or an assignment to use their new loud voice somewhere outside of the treatment room, and they have this all 30 days of the month. With these individuals, we might have a coach or a caregiver help as needed. So in some cases, it might just be having someone remind the client that they need to do their homework uh, after treatment sometime that day, or have a coach or caregiver kind of monitor the, the homework and making sure that they're doing each one of the exercises. And a clinician would educate the, the coach or the caregiver on what would be appropriate in terms of, of helping with homework and letting them know what homework looks like and educating them on that process and the techniques. We also have a homework helper video. It's available on DVD or streaming, and it's actually, it's Dr. Fox walking clients through the exercises. So that can be a helpful video um, tool. Also, you can pop that in or play it on your computer, and the client can follow along with Dr. Fox's models uh, with the exercises so that they're getting their homework practice every day. We also have a program called the LSVT Companion System that can be installed on a computer and with this, a clinician can program goals for a client, and so a client can follow along on their computer and do the exercises that the clinician would program it, how many repetitions of each exercise the client would do at home, but they can actually do the exercises on their own and get feedback based on the goals the clinician has set. So it will tell them, oh, that was loud enough, but can you go longer next time? And that's based on what the clinician set in terms of the goals that the client should reach. So that can also be a helpful tool to keep clients motivated and, and practicing and accountable every day. Homework practice will either be one time a day or two times a day during the month of treatment. Um, if a client has treatment for the day, they just do homework one other time during, the, during that day. If they don't have treatment that day, then they do homework two other times per day. And then after treatment, we'll get into this, but they're going to continue to do homework once a day for the rest of their life, again, to help maintain that loud voice as much as possible. So now we'll talk about some considerations and treatment strategies to help maximize those LSVT loud outcomes. And a consideration we've talked about throughout the presentation is we will likely need support from family members, caregivers, nursing staff, to help make the best possible outcome for these clients. So one way to include them is using perceptual rating scales on communication and voice and functional impact to see we would have the client rate themselves and then also a family member or caregiver to see what's challenging in the beginning before they're starting treatment and then how that's changing throughout the course of the treatment protocol. We would of course carefully train others on how to cue to make sure that cueing outside of the treatment room is appropriate. Um, for example, we don't want someone to feel like they're being nagged every time they're talking, but rather we would say, you know, when, you're, when your loved one or your client says, you know, a two or three word utterance, then you can cue them to be loud. And here's an appropriate cue you can say, use your loud voice. As opposed to at the dinner table saying, oh, be louder, be louder, be louder, every single time they open their mouth, we would, of course, educate caregivers on what would be appropriate to make sure that we're still having positive influences outside of the treatment room. And then islands of lucidity. So we know that clients are not always going to feel their best. They're, you know, um, on or off their medications. They did not sleep well. There's other things going on that can get in the way of how they're feeling so we still say have clients come in at times when they not, may not be feeling their best because it's important to show clients that they can still 
communicate even when they're not feeling their best because they're still going to need to communicate when others with others even when when they're not at their best and so it's okay to have treatment sessions during those times in terms of motor fluctuations again they may come in you know off their medication cycle or have dyskinesias as as a drug um, related effect um, of the medication that can get in the way of or just I should say not get in the way but make treatment a little more difficult but that's okay um, clinicians can still work with some of those situations and still make some really nice functional improvements in terms of um, location for treatment sessions um, think about the client's cognition. I always think about distractibility, so trying to have a nice, you know, kind of clean office space, uh, no clutter in there to make sure there's not outside distractors, so a nice quiet room, again, organized room so that the client can only focus on the clinician as opposed to being distracted by other things going on. Uh, we also encourage trying to go in the home environment, and we have a lot of home health providers that, that will do treatment obviously in the home and that can be a really nice very salient place to do treatment um, and sometimes necessary to do treatment but even in the home environment making sure that you're choosing a location in the home that's a, that's void of any types of distractors or loud noises so again that the client can really focus on the clinician and for transportation issues so we have had some clients uh, who have difficulties getting to the clinic either um, they don't have access to transportation you know one suggestion we had actually from an lsvt big clinician um, was you know as a client part of a church or other type of organization that might be willing to arrange transportation so maybe they have volunteers that could you know say on mondays i'm going to take john to the clinic and then and they could arrange some type of transportation that way we also have telehealth sessions so what we call lsvt e loud where some of the sessions can be done over the internet. So the clinician is in their clinic or home office and the client can be in their home their home environment and they would just be doing the treatment through the computer screen or connected to the, to the internet and do the treatment that way. So that's another possibility to look into. The LSVT companion that I mentioned can also be programmed for full treatment sessions. So some of those sessions can be done at home where the clinician would program the companion to provide feedback and then amount of repetitions for a full treatment session instead of just a homework session. So that can ease um, some of the burden of having to travel to the clinic every single day. Some other strategies um, and adaptations. So treatment should be done in a room separate from others, again, with as few distractions as possible. Uh, the clinician will really focus on modeling behaviors as opposed to lengthy clinical explanations. And this is something we tell all our clinicians um, that a big, teaching technique that we utilize in treatment is to model the behavior you want your client to do. So they'll really focus on modeling with these advanced populations even more so um, to make sure that we're limiting any of those kind of that cognitive load for the client. And then repetition, repetition, repetition. So lots of repetition, lots of motor practice for the client so that they get used to this loud voice, um, they rev up their system and they're really getting that good motor practice the full hour of treatment. We keep the focus of treatment very simple. So the treatment target is always focused on loudness, even when other communication deficits are present. And Dr. Fox mentioned some other areas that may, uh, other communication areas that may be of concern for the client. They might be more concerned about articulation or rate, um, intonation, other things. But the clinician is only going to focus on loudness for the client to keep that target simple. And under that focus of loudness or under that umbrella of loudness, we can see a spread of effects into other areas of communication as well. Dr. Fox also mentioned we may need to treat beyond the four weeks. So for some of these clients, we may get to the end of four weeks and think, oh, if I just had one more week of treatment, then I could really get them to that next level of independence or calibrate them even further. So we may add another week of treatment beyond that four weeks. Um, once the client is able to follow the modeling by the speech clinician, again, we may educate care partners so they can be a coach in the home environment for homework practice or just appropriate external cueing. Uh, some other considerations for physical concerns. So again, considering adding some telehealth sessions to reduce the fatigue from traveling. And then just making sure clinicians acknowledge a patient's fatigue within the treatment session. So validate those feelings of fatigue having longer rest periods between the repetitions or between the exercises, um, and just knowing that those are physical concerns that the client has. So after LSVT Loud, how do we try to make this as successful as possible? 
So once LSVT Lab concludes, a clients will continue to do daily practice every, so every single day they'll continue to do daily LSVT Lab practice with a coach or caregiver, perhaps with the homework helper DVD or video with the LSVT companion system, or in group, they can do group maintenance in a loud for life group, um, which is continued maintenance in a support, you know, a supportive setting with other clients who have also done LSVT loud treatment. So that ongoing maintenance therapy, again, something like um, a loud for life group or perhaps seeing your clinician once a week and having that ongoing maintenance, having, you know, a mini tune up session once a week. Um, continually after treatment can really help maintain those those changes and then tune up so we have clinicians check in every one to three months post treatment and then perhaps bring clients in for those tune up sessions which are mini LSVT loud sessions instead of a whole 16 um, day protocol they would just do you know anywhere from I mean it could be anywhere from one to 16 sessions typically two to two to eight sessions where a clinician would do some of those LSVT loud sessions again to get that system back into doing that daily practice. So we also want to mention some supplemental strategies and these are some things that may be utilized or may be helpful after a client has done behavioral treatment and we've gotten the best kind of the optimal voice that we can get independently with the client. So some things that we have on here are voice banking for future augmentative device and so this may be something that a client never needs um, but it can be nice to do at the end of LSVT Loud when we kind of optimize that voice production. And this is where a client would um, bank their voice and there's more information in the handout that you receive, but they would, they would basically be recording and storing their voice for potentially future use if they needed it on an augmentative communication device so that they can preserve their voice and always have that be played. And if they never need it for that reason, it also can help build the bank to help others um, who may potentially need a voice later on. Um, and this can also be a nice opportunity to practice because there's hours, um, hours that go into recording the voice. And so this is great practice for the client as well. So altered auditory feedback, um, either speech easy or speech vibe. These are different types of devices similar to I guess kind of the look of a hearing aid that can be utilized to give some type of outside influence that can uh, assist with the patient speaking. Um, and then also some listener strategies. So we'll break that down. This is the voice baking. This is just some more information on it and the website if you want to take a look at that. And again, you have a handout for that one if you're interested. Speech Easy is a device that uses delayed auditory feedback or frequency altered feedback to reduce paleolalia in advanced Parkinson's. So that is more of that fast, rapid rate of speech in advanced PD. And by altering either the pitch or the, the delay of the person speaking, it almost gives a sensation of choral speaking where they're speaking with someone else. And that can help with that with improving that rate. So that's something to look into the Speech Easy. And there's more information on this slide here. And Speech Vive um, uses what's called the Lombard effect to increase loudness. So by playing um, some type of, uh, of audio, usually a, a speaking type sensation in the, the client's ear, it, it causes them to speak above what's being played in their ear and improve their volume or, or speak louder. So this can be an external cue to help them use their loud voice. Um, if they need it more for carryover. So any of these types of kind of supplemental strategies, we do recommend always trying that behavioral intervention first, seeing what we can get independently. And these may be some secondary strategies that can help with that maintenance or carryover of that new voice. Some listener strategies, so for those who are care partners or family members, so trying to eliminate background noise and distractions, using yes, no questions, um, ask for clarifications, did you say you want a hamburger for dinner? When asking to repeat, use the single cue. So say that with a loud voice. Use familiar topics, provide cho choices for the responses. Do you want a hamburger or a hot dog? Um, and then making sure that you're facing the speaker so that um, kind of your pathway to communication is optimized. And then in summary, we just wanna say there is hope. Don't discount therapy just because the disease or is advanced or is atypical. Um, people with advanced Parkinson's and typical park and atypical PD can have amazing outcomes and really that functional communication um, and with LSVT big, any of that movement of any kind can really dramatically improve quality of life. Even if that supplementation is required or even if we still need some external cueing, we can still have a really big functional impact. 
So LSV2 Loud is applicable to all stages of Parkinson's, and then we've seen how it can be customized to each patient's needs and treatment settings. It can in increase independence, client confidence, quality and or safety with communication and activities of daily living. So we say restore function, improve function, maintain function, and we're really looking at those functional impacts that we can have with the voice treatment. So we know that atypical and advanced Parkinson's can carry unique challenges that do require some creative solutions and usually will also involve um, increased caregiver involvement with the treatment process. We also just have some more organizations listed here, so I won't go through, through each of them, but just so that you know on your slides, some related organizations to more advanced or atypical Parkinsonisms, um, and then also more places to learn more about Parkinson's in general. If you're interested in learning or receiving LSVT Loud um, or LSVT Big, which is the physical and occupational therapy program, this just shows you how to find clinicians on our website. So all these clinicians have gone through a training to be certified to deliver either LSVT Loud or LSVT Big. And then when you find someone in your area, you can ask your doctor for a referral to one of those clinicians. These are also some other resources that are available for you. So we do these public webinars once a month, both live, so in, uh, just like we're doing here, a live broadcast. They're also all recorded and they're available on demand and you can find those on our website at lsvtglobal.com so you can look at any of the previous um, recorded topics that have been done. We also do live LSVT Big and LSVT Loud seminars, or I should say in person, and those locations are worldwide. So you can look at that on the website as well. The Homework Helper DVDs are available for streaming um, or in DVD format, and you can find those on Vimeo. Here the links are listed, or our website or Amazon, they're available also. And then if you're interested in looking for a Big for Life or Loud for Life maintenance group, you can find a clinician in your area and see if it shows on their profile that they are Loud for Life or Big for Life certified, or you can always contact us, so info at lsvtglobal.com, and we can look for a clinician for you. And then you can always email us. So again, any questions that you have, feel free to email us. And I know we're at our hour limit, so if you need to get off, feel free um, to exit the webinar. Um, we appreciate you being here, but we will spend, we'll stay on for about um, five or ten more minutes to address any questions that come up. Um, so again, if you have questions, there are a few ways to ask your questions. You can type your question in the question box on your control panel. Um, you can also raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon or you can always email us, so webinars at lsvtglobal.com if you think of questions after the webinar here today. Okay, and then when you do exit out of the webinar, um, either if you have to exit now or if you stay on for a few minutes for questions, there should be a survey that pops up, and again, we do appreciate any responses on that survey so that we can make sure we're doing the best that we can for these webinars. Okay, so we have had a couple come through. So Dr. Fox, I'll have you take this first one. Is LSVT Loud still reimbursed for atypical Parkinson's even though there's not as much research to support it? Yes, I was working to get myself unmuted. Um, absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, when you look at any speech therapeutic speech therapy approach for atypical Parkinson disease, um, the data are limited no matter what. Uh, LSVT Lab actually does have some publications, some case studies, and um, a small group design. It, it wasn't huge, but it's a, at least some data to support that. I think as with any patient we're working with in any condition in any speech treatment we're offering, being able to define medical necessity, which of course in atypical and advanced Parkinson disease is clear as a bell, um, showing that your skilled care is required, and then documenting what you're doing. So it, it lies in documentation, and then using the proper coding that matches whether your Medicare or the patient's insurance. So not only can the treatments be covered, but also keep in mind that the therapy cap was repealed. And what that means is if patients such as individuals with advanced or atypical Parkinson disease need more care, we should be, and it's reasonable, unnecessary, we should be able to provide that. Keeping in mind that all the, although the cap has been re, uh, repealed, there is an initial threshold. At that dollar amount, you need to start using KX modifiers. There's also um, a threshold at which uh, 
your claims may be subject to medical manual review. Again, those aren't stop gaps that treatment can't be provided, uh, but you documenting your services um, can really help and offer this care that these patients certainly need. All right, thank you, Dr. Fox. And this is a follow-up to that, if you don't mind continuing. So can you address sure. tune-ups in terms of insurance? So when doing monthly or every three months, we would need to do new evaluations. Does insurance continue to cover this? You know, that uh, that's a similar one that sometimes you may need to take on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and I'll give you a brief overview. If you have additional questions, make a comment, and I'll connect you with our LSVT expert um, who has a little bit more knowledge on, you know, uh, daily reimbursement. But oftentimes, if they've been, it might be a case where, um, again, depends upon how your facility wants to handle it. A file is kept open because you're seeing your patient once a week for maintenance, you know, some kind of continued um, care that's provided to help them. In some cases, the file may be closed out. And when they come back in, it's a reassess, but it's not necessarily a full brand new, you know, intensive assessment that you may have done on your first one. Um, you know, some people are able to reassess quickly, say, okay, here's where the patient was a discharge with those goals. I can quickly reassess where they're at today. And based on that reassessment, I would recommend you know, maybe if you haven't seen them in two months, I would recommend four to six sessions so that we can reestablish some of the, the behaviors they had at the end of the last treatment cycle. So um, as I said, we'd be happy to give you some more specifics or if you have a, a particular question related to a particular patient, email that in to either webinars at lsvtglobal.com or info at lsvtglobal.com and we'll connect you with Dr. Galgano who can walk you through a few more of those details. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Fox. And one thing I was just going to add, um, there, there was a Medicare case in 2015, that Jim over Sibelius, which did make it necessary for insurance to reimburse even in the face of degenerative diseases. So before that, there had it had been more, more difficult um, because we know with Parkinson's and, and these other ones that we're talking to, talking to you about today, there is a degenerative course of the disease, but it is still considered reimbursable even in the face of those types of diseases. So you also have that on your side um, to assist with that rationale for reimbursement. And so again, as she mentioned before, making sure it's medically necessary and that the skill of an SLP is necessary to do the treatment and, and any of the follow-up care as well. All right, and we had one other question come through, so we'll address that one. Um, so I was curious if it's recommended to complete LSVT Loud and LSVT Big training on the same day or during the same time frame, if indicated for someone. So that, you know, that kind of, I guess, is dependent on the client and what they can tolerate um, and, I guess, scheduling as well for your clinic. So we don't have a set protocol that we know is best for certain clients. Um, but I would say, you know, we've certainly had clinics who will do same day. So we'll have LSVT loud in the morning, LSVT big in the afternoon, and so forth. We also have clinics who will do a month of LSVT loud or LSVT big, and then they'll do the next treatment the next month. So then they'll do LSVT loud and LSVT big. With these more advanced populations that we're talking about today, I would probably probably recommend doing doing the treatment separately. So a month of one and a month of the other, just because there is more of that fatigue and some of those, um, I guess, kind of extras that are going on. Um, but for clients who can tolerate it, it's fine to do it the same day. We do say if you are doing it the same day, you just want to make sure that you're not always doing one treatment first and like for example, LSVT loud first and LSVT big second. It's nice if you can kind of alternate or at least switch that up either by the week or every other day switching it up so that you're you're not always getting a fresh patient or a, a more fatigued patient, for example. So that's what I would say. Um, kind of the short answer is there's no you know set way to do it, and it is client dependent on what they what they can tolerate and and what their goals are and what they want. So. Um, in terms of if you're going to do one month of one first and the, the second month uh, of a different treatment, you can talk to them about what their what their most pressing goals are. So are they more concerned about, you know, functional communication or safety for falls? And then according to that, you would start one treatment in front of the other. 
All right, I think we've addressed all the questions that came through. So we thank everyone for being here today. And again, feel free to email us if you would, uh, or if you do think of another question. And then for anyone who's in the audience and who does want a certificate of completion, just email webinars at lsbtglobal.com with the title of this webinar or the date, and let us know that you'd like a certificate, and then we'll email one to you, um, usually, usually in just a few days, but up to two weeks we give them to send those out. So thank you and thank you, Dr. Fox, for being here. We really appreciate everyone's time and attention. Thank you.